Well, hello, everyone. It is Friday. Uh, I'm Rita McGrath. You probably knew that. Uh, and my guest this week is Bob Sutton, a uh, dear friend who we go back a long, longer, longer than either of us probably want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Bob is at the engineering school at Stanford, one of their most beloved professors, prolific author, uh, great thinker, um, and I think um, has a fantastic perspective on um, you know, work in organizations, life in organizations. And so, um, welcome. Thank you. Great for to see you, Rita. I'm excited to be here. Finally. <laughs> We've been so, thinking finally. about this for years. I know. <laughs> Imagine a meeting that takes two years to set up, right? Uh, it's, it's all right. <laughs> So um, just for those of you, a little housekeeping, uh, this is being recorded, so don't say anything you don't want your grandmother finding out about. Um, and we will have the replay available in a few days once we tidy it up. and oh, get great. It. So, Bob, you describe yourself as an organizational psychologist. Maybe tell us a little bit of a Oh, you gosh. You know, it's, it's funny. I, I describe myself as an organizational psychologist, I mean, for years. And then our pal, Adam Grant, he called calls himself an organizational psychologist first. We come from the same PhD program. I'm much older than he is. And so now people always ask me what I mean by an organizational psychologist. So, uh, and if, if you go way back, I mean, my God, I've, it's been more than 40 years. I, I've been doing whatever this business is. And, and the way that I think about organizational psychology, which is different than, so, so a, a, a social psychologist or personality psychologist, they'll tend to focus on the individual and, and but the difference, and I think of organizational psychology as sort of a spin-off of social psychology. Mm -hmm. What we do as organizational psychologists, and, and the, to me, the giants in the field would be Ed Shine, who just passed away. He wrote the he literally wrote the book on organizational psychology. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. like a hundred and years old or something. And my mentor, uh, Robert L. Kahn, who passed also passed away about uh, about a hundred. And and the what what they'll look at and what I tend to think about is well okay so there's this person or into this team and there's always kind of an interplay between what they're doing and what the organization is doing mm -hmm. so so I'm not just interested in the personality I'm interested in the interplay and, and just to give you a kind of specific example I was kind of thinking of is uh so the book that my pal Huggy Rao and I've been working on forever I think we're a week from having the writing done so an organizational friction. So we stole an idea from a pal of ours, Chip Heath. Okay, mm -hmm. and and we have so we've got a chapter on coordination problems, and and we all know there's all sorts of coordination problems in organization, but the main concept we have there is the notion that we human beings, so we have these cognitive biases. There's this bias, Chip calls it coordination neglect, and that means that when we're in a silo, for example, we tend to focus so narrowly that we don't think about how it connects to the rest of the organization. So that's that's called component focus. So, so I'm an organizational psychologist, and I think it's the most important thing. Economists, sociologists, they don't know what they're talking about. All that matters is organizational psychology. That would be <laughs> focus. But then there's another kind of thing, which is, and, and Chip shows this, and so that leads to organizational problems where the silos don't work together. And then there's another problem, and my my colleague, Melissa Valentine, one, does wonderful ethnographic work um, in, in my department. She studies this, it's called um, partition focus. So this is, and she's got a wonderful uh, case study of the birth of a cancer uh, center. And, and the leaders, they hired all of the best oncologists, bought all the best equipment and broke them into departments and specialties so that so they, they broke the thing into pieces and they never really thought about how the pieces fit together so so it's to sort of back up and this is a, to me an example of organizational psychology is what we're interested in is well first of all what causes people to not look beyond their silo and second leaders to just think if they just buy the best pieces, they've got the best organization. And my my colleague, uh, David Kelly, talks about some leaders think that they're building a group dental practice. You know, like there's like a receptionist and then there's all the little parts and nobody ever needs to talk to each other mm -hmm. unless the building burns down and they have to tell everybody to leave. So, that, um, so, so, so then as a psychologist, I'll start thinking about, well, what things can people and leaders do to get more empathy and understanding for the whole system? Mm -hmm. And and uh, since you're you're in New York or maybe New Jersey right now, I, I sort of think of uh, I had I had this great uh, I was I was on a MacArthur panel for a few years and there was this high school principal from New York, and she was describing how she was always mad at the students who were late. 
okay? They're always late. It's the student's problem. And what she did was she shadowed uh, students for a couple of days. And what she found out was, so this was in one of these like seven or eight story buildings. The reason that they were late a lot of times is the teacher would hold them, hold them back from court classes. And she describes following a woman had to go up seven flights of stairs in five minutes. And she said, oh, well, we had designed a system you know, partition focus, we didn't realize how the pieces fit together. And we had to change the norms, we had to give students a little bit more time. But, you know, and maybe that's too long winded. But but as an organizational psychologist, I, I will tend to think about like, how are people thinking? But then how do the pieces sort of fit together? And and so, in, for example, the stuff that Huggy and I have done on scaling in organizations, we're really interested in what skills does a leader need, so they can build a great organization. So that that would be organizational psychology. So maybe that's too long a rant, but but almost everything I do sort of fits in that bucket one way or another. Mm-hmm. So one of the, um, so the book with Huggy, just a shout out to the book, is called Scaling Up Excellence. It's fantastic. Um, really, really great book uh, for anybody that wants to grow a business, grow a company, you know, just expand your, your spheres of influence. Um, a lot of very practical uh, tips there. Um, but of course, the book, one of the books you're very famous for is called The uh, No Asshole Rule. <laughs> My lot in life. I'm the asshole guy. I've done it to myself. Yes. <laughs> Yes, we, we belong to this author's group. And one of the things that we, the pieces of advice we all given each other is you have to be in love with your concept because it's going to follow you the rest of oh, your oh. life. Or, or the, but then sometimes the ones you love the most, nobody ever pays any attention to. Yeah, so huh? it's hard to predict it. There's it's so much randomness. I, I love that advice, actually. Yeah. Yes. But, um, but I mean, one of the things that strikes me, and you and I have had a little exchange about this, is, you know, that book. We, I mean, it's been out for a long time now, but it continues to thrive. And I think that just points to the level of toxicity that so many people experience. So maybe, maybe could you dig into that a little? Because I think we're in this moment of reckoning. Right. On many, many levels. Right. And, and like you, I would like to believe that organizations are capable of being places where people can, you know, become their best selves, yes. do their best work, live a good life with dignity, be paid well, you know, have challenging assignments grow. <laughs> I mean, right, that's how right. I would like to think of organizations, but, but a lot of people don't have that experience. Yeah, a lot of people don't have don't have that experience. Yeah, I mean, I mean, just in fact, and I really am trying to avoid using his name because I'm just sick of him. But uh but but Elon Musk just I think yesterday fired somebody who gave him bad news. This mm-hmm. is almost a perfect and, and so and I know a lot of people who work for and even more people who used to work for Elon Musk. Mm-hmm. And and uh he might be the biggest genius ever. And he's got all these tech bros who love him. But but people who work for him, he takes away their dignity. Mm-hmm. And my so and, and we were talking before. Um so and, and a lot of this comes from my two key mentors, two uh well really three Bob Kahn I talked about and and a guy named J. Richard Hackman, who is an amazing person, passed away, the, the greatest groups researcher who ever, ever lived. That, And I think of two outcomes. I think of dignity. And I think, yes, I believe that performance or providing great health care or building a great building, whatever your dependent performance variable is, I believe both of those are important. And I believe both of those are possible. Um, and, um, and, <laughs> And, and 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 if you're somebody who just sort of kills everybody along the way, bless you, you can be like the most wonderful capitalist. I don't want anything to do with you. There's lots of people who do great stuff. And I just to give you an example in a completely different industry, and I learned a lot about them because I had heart surgery there. Uh, the Cleveland Clinic is really a good example of this. And uh, so uh, 12 years ago, I needed open heart surgery. I flew the 2000 miles to the Cleveland Clinic. And uh, they have better heart heart outcomes than Stanford does. But some of it is that you can just see how people treat one another. They have really high standards for performance. But uh, Toby Cosgrove, who was running the Cleveland Clinic in those days, I met him. He said, I fire people, surgeons, the best surgeons who are assholes. I fire them. Hmm. And and, and, and my, my surgeon, Mark Gillenoff, he told me the same thing. He said, "You, you really, you can't be an asshole surgeon here and survive." It's like, and and I'm, I can tell you at Stanford, you can be an asshole surgeon and survive because I know a lot of them. And, and 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 so 
the effect of it, and this is a case where it's a virtuous circle, our friend Amy Edmondson, she has all sorts of evidence. Who Amy Edmondson, I just worship Amy Edmondson. I think she's just like a goddess. That woman is so smart and such a good human being. Um, Amy has all sorts of evidence that, well, when the doctor creates fear, people don't tell them when they've made a mistake. Right. And and so, uh, so, so anyways, I'm sort of going on a rant, but 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 my argument is, and, and a lot of people have different values than I do, and bless you, is that if performance is your only dependent variable, well, we as a species are not in very good shape. And Cleveland Clinic's an example. Uh, Google at various times um, has been has been a, a pretty good example. Um, and even you know, Apple can be kind of nasty. But nonetheless, people the people I know who work for Tim Cook will say, hey, actually, that's kind of how he is. And Steve Jobs got better with age. And then our friend Ed Catmull, and anybody ever worked for Ed Catmull will tell you that. I mean, he did a pretty good job at Pixar, building one of the greatest companies ever. And, and he treated people with respect. Mm -hmm. So it is possible. So, the, so, so this perspective, so, so people always want to have the argument, well, this asshole got ahead. Or um, they got ahead anyways. Well, my perspective is that we as a species, can't we treat each other with some respect mm -hmm. and, and still do great work? It, it appears to be possible and sometimes it even helps. Mm -hmm. That's that's kind of my rant, I guess, about about the no asshole rule. Yeah, but why do you why do you think it, it persists? Because I mean, and Jeff's you know, Jeff Effer, who we were talking about. Oh, earlier. our friend, oh, he thinks it's great, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, he's done research, like in his in his book um, on on healthcare, uh, dying for a paycheck. Yeah, you know, it says the data are all there, right? I mean, if you want to see who's creating, um, you know, stress at work, who right. are antidepressants, uh, what kind of health coverage conditions are people going, you could find out if you wanted to. Um, it just we don't seem to want to. And then Wait, our our other yep. friend Zainab Tan um, has a fantastic new book coming out, and I'm going to be talking to her about this, which is. Uh, the case for good jobs, right? And you know, basically, pay well, treat people, right. differently, give them a path to advancement. I mean, it's been shown to be connected with high performance. So why do we continue to struggle so much to create sort of more humane organizations? Well, well, it's interesting that you talk about my friend Jeff Effer, who I did write two books with, by the uh -huh. way. So I wrote two books with him, and I that disagree. With, uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that was the first one. He he writes. He is just a genius. But you know, sometimes. Uh, people can be really smart and you may not um, agree with him, but, but Jeff will make all sorts of arguments. So, so he, he's not a consistent person as none of us human beings are consistent. So, so this would certainly apply to me, but he will make this argument about dying for a paycheck and how nasty organizations are um, to people. And then he'll teach power in politics and, and he'll basically glorify people who crush others in, in his perspective is sort of, Oh, well, I'm sorry that uh that works to get ahead, but it really does work. And then we have another friend, Adam Grant, who will give you much different data that the people who get ahead, well, fortunately, they both, uh, well, they're givers and takers. That's the book that made Adam Adam famous. And, and so I would, if you can get those two guys to debate, I want to see it because they real because I, I get the backstage gossip from both of them. <laughs> but, but um, I'm on Adam's side. But, uh, but Jeff, you know, Jeff's pretty hard to argue with. He's a brilliant guy. Mm -hmm. Well, and um, I mean, his perspective, as I understand it, is, you know, that, that we need to understand the rules of the game if we want to yes. play it well, right? And, and I, I, I appreciate that. Um, I, I mean, I, I thought his most recent book was super interesting. Um, and it does, you know, it does speak to some of the stuff, like, like I look at, like, our political system. I look uh -huh. at some people that do get ahead, and I'm thinking... Why is that even possible? Um, and uh, and and you know, there's a certain kind of resonance, I think, that is. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and so so, unfortunately, that's what I wish Jeff was completely wrong. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 I'll, I'll tell you a funny story about Jeff. So Jeff gets the no asshole rule, and he reads it. And he said, "I read that book." He said, "I actually don't agree with a lot of it, ex except for the chapter on the virtues of assholes. I do have a chapter on the virtues of assholes." <laughs> and it, Jeff, he said, now, th "That should have been the whole book." That's kind of like Jeff's view of the world. I see. Um, but um, so, so I mean, so he's he's a complicated character. But but I mean, Jeff's notion that organizations do all this sort of nasty stuff to people. Um, yeah. Well, some of it is financial incentive. Some of it, which you know, I think is, and this is an organizational psychology thing too. And uh, there is really a lot of research that when human beings get more power, 
So Dr. Keltner, I have, I have his book in these piles here somewhere. Dr. Keltner has this, has this great book on the power paradox. And here's his argument. His argument is, he's a great psychologist. Um, his argument is that uh, the way that you get into a position of power is by making friends and doing favors and being a civilized human being. But when you get in power, it and he's he's even made the argument, it's like you have damage to your frontal lobes. It's, 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 so, so, so you, 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 you focus more on your own needs. Uh, you have less impulse control, by the way, you focus less on the needs of others and you act like the rules don't apply to you. Now, I think that's a pretty good description of Elon Musk's behavior right now. Mm -hmm. And so, and I won't use the names that there's some people I know. So, so there are certain people we know who worked with Elon for years and, and say that, well, he always had some of these tendencies but now, now he, when he became the richest person in the world, those behaviors came out even more. Mm. And but 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 it's really an interesting um, perspective on power. And I think and, and it might explain why, uh, it, in some ways, Jeff is right that the path to power is to be a, a mensch, and once you get there, you turn into a jerk. <laughs> and, and, you know, this whole idea that absolute power corrupts, uh, there's some evidence to support that. And, and that's why I think that people who are in positions of power who run good organizations, they surround themselves with people, and this is out of Amy Edmondson's research too, who tell them that they're wrong, who tell them that they're screwing up. Um, so the, 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 there was this, there was an, uh, um, Je or Huggy and I, we never did these, this research. My co-author Huggy Rao and I, we had this. We had two hypotheses at one one point. One is that people. So this is like male CEOs, classic stereotypical male Fortune 500 CEOs. So if you looked at the dudes who had the original wife, okay, um, because when you've got the original wife, they tell you you're wrong. Like, like they <laughs> they, aren't, they aren't the trophy wife. So we had, we, had, we had this hypothesis that ones who had a trophy wife um, were because were more likely to be nasty bosses. Um, be, because because they, they they kind of dispose of the ones who who get in the way and are difficult, right? Um, and then we had children that because when you have children, like you you want to maybe model for them. I, but but I, the the trophy wife thing, I and I think that works pretty well actually. It, and, it, and it'd be really interesting to see what happens if their behavior gets worse when they get rid of the original model. So. <laughs> So, but, but I mean, that's kind of a weird hypothesis, but Huggy and I sort of like got obsessed about this. And I think he even did a little work on it. I don't know what happened to it, but, but the, the key point I'm making, and this is straight out of Amy Edmondson stuff is that when people are in power, you need somebody to kind of bring you down and give you the bad news. Cause there's always bad news. Of course. Oh yeah. So, I mean, um, there, I do know of one research study that was done of CEOs um, and I guess there's a narcissism scale that you can you can look at oh yeah yeah there's so many <laughs> yeah. but I mean you look at them outside so you don't have to have like access to them yeah yeah they scale them on this thing and so there was a, st a study done um, on this narcissism scale and they were trying to correlate it to as you mentioned factors in their personal lives uh -huh. and what they found was that the least likely to be high on the narcissism scale were those that had teenage children at home <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know if you've ever had any teenage children at home. Oh, before. yes. Are, are they happy to tell you how stupid you are every day? Oh, totally. Oh, totally. <laughs> I had, um, in fact, I had a couple of my son's friends from business school um, over at our house. They were spending the weekend and we got into a whole long, you know, uh -huh. Like conversation, right? And his friends were really impressed, and they said, "Oh, you know, your, your mom really knows a lot about." It. And he kind of looked at me and said, "Yeah, yeah, that's because like you're on her turf." Ask her what was on TV <laughs> last night. Not a chance. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't sure whether that was a criticism or whether that was a note of appreciation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I, so I, my friend, I don't know if you know Diego Rodriguez. He's uh, we go way back. Mm -hmm. uh, so Diego wrote uh, "Power Always Reveals." Caro. So that's the famous author, Caro. I think that. that uh, so the, actually, Diego has a reasonable point about power. That 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 some of the stuff that um, that uh, uh, Dr. Keltner and so on shows is, is so so it reduces inhibition. So you, your so-called true self comes out more. So there are some people under power actually might 
still get be good or stay better because they're sort of good sort of sort sort of people. And I, I almost mentioned the name of the politicians, but I never mentioned the name of politicians. But but there's one I'm thinking of in particular who, even though I don't agree with him politically, I'm always impressed that his goodness comes out despite his power. Anyways. Um well, so you know, one of the more interesting people um and, and Diego mentions uh, Robert Caro. Um and if you read Caro's biography link biographies of Lincoln um, of, um Lyndon Johnson oh. um that you know According to his telling, Johnson did everything, you know, in a, in a masterful way to gather power, but that once he had power, he actually wanted to implement his own agenda, you know, civil rights and, and you know, various other, other things. And I know there's been some debate about his motivations for doing that, but, right. he, he, you know, he did not continue along the trajectory that got him into power. Yeah, I mean, so I, I so I have that. I also, if, if you ever listen to his tapes, they're absolutely amazing. I, I once there's because there, he, he taped himself before Nixon did. That's that's where Nixon got the idea to tape himself, as Johnson had had taped himself. Mm -hmm. um, but but I mean, to your point, um, Lyndon Johnson's really interesting because he actually did a bunch of racist things when he was young. Because mm -hmm. well, being a, a a Democrat in um in Texas, that is a place that the racist things actually got you in. But then he gets in power and he he gets through the best civil rights um you know legislation in history, the most important one. So very complicated person. Yeah, one of the interesting stories that Carol tells is um, how Johnson um, broke the stalemate about getting the the civil rights legislation through, and there were kind of three groups of people in the Senate. So there was the northeastern types, and they were they were kind of with him. The southerners dead set against him, and then there was this group from the Rocky Mountain states, and um, and they didn't have any black people, <laughs> so <laughs> it kind of wasn't an issue for them. Um, but what they wanted was they wanted this dam over the Snake River to oh. keep electricity for the for the mountain states. Um, and so, I mean, this was an ecological disaster. I mean, this is an unambiguously right. kind of negative thing for the environment. But Johnson basically went to them and he said, "Look, you you vote with me on civil rights, I'll get you your dam." And that's what happened. Um, and of course, now well, here we are, all these years later, and we are now reckoning with the environment. We, we have the rec yeah. So, because of Jeff and other folks, I've got obsessed with Carol too. So we could go on and on. But mm -hmm. one thing I do remember about Johnson, and this is straight out of the Jeff Effer playbook, mm -hmm. is that uh, Johnson would have an aide come with him. Who and he had just a list of every favor he'd done for every politician his entire life, oh. so that's why he would be able to get the uh, the unlikely person who would um, um, do his legislation was it, it would be like I did you a favor twenty five years ago when I was a congressman and boom he was he, he was I, I'm not that good a politician maybe some maybe some people in your organization are just crazy it's 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 wild I mean you know the, the and the skill of it you know it was just just amazing and you know the way he like sucked up to the powerful people there um so um our friend Juan Miguel wants to know how do you how do you if you do, and I, I know you do, work with CEOs, um, and you think they're, you know, could use a little <laughs> tough uh, feedback. How do you have those conversations? Well, you know that that I mean that is an interesting conversation because so 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 if they have narcissism or asshole problems or something, so so here's the problem. Is is that um, they almost never want to talk about it. So I mean, you know, to tell tales out of school or maybe in school. So uh, so. My best-selling book by far is The No Asshole Rule. It sold almost a million copies worldwide. Mm -hmm. I think I've been paid what I would describe as top speaking fees five times or less to talk about The No Asshole Rule. Huh. And, and, and then the uh, Scaling Up Excellence, 300 times. So what's going on is that is that when they've got asshole problems, they don't want to talk about it. And, and, and there's also, this is a, a bias here. If you ask the average American, there's good, uh, mediocre national surveys. So have you ever um, had an asshole in the workplace, a, a bully? Mm -hmm. a about 30 or 40% of us say yes. And about 10% of us say, I've got one right now. Okay. Um, less than one half of 1% will ever admit that they're bullies or assholes. So, mm -hmm. so, so. And, and there are, and so, so getting even some acknowledgement in, 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 in one way to answer uh, the question is, is I, I tend to distinguish between uh, what I call temporary assholes and certified assholes. And, 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 <laughs> certified and, and, assholes. I love that. <laughs> and, 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 you know, maybe you are a perfect human being, but I can't 
I don't know anybody who who is ever um, never an asshole. I mean, and 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 that's the other thing is is we're talking about as a personality thing. There's really reliable ways that uh, social psychologists can turn people into jerks. Um, it's uh, put them in a hurry, have them be sleep deprived, mm-hmm. have them be surrounded by nasty people, insult them. Like we will start acting like that. And by the way, negative behavior is very contagious. If you go into a place where everybody's acting like a jerk, mm-hmm. and in some ways it's also rational because you've got to push back because you're just in a nasty, nasty place. Mm-hmm. So, but, but to go back to Miguel's question, the thing that, that I try to do and, and, and Amy and Edmondson and I sing a similar song is to try to like expose them to data mm-hmm. and, and also to have them have conversations with people who will tell them the truth. So mm-hmm. the classic thing is that is that um so i won't name the ceo but one ceo i know a woman so uh, so she was in a situation where she was on the verge of firing somebody who kept complaining to her and giving her bad news behind her back and then after talking to another ceo this is where they actually this is a really important ceos they need one another um you know like a ceo support group those things actually do matter what what the fellow CEO told her said is, you know, um, that person is probably telling you the truth and it hurts. Why don't you try listening to that person? So this is early in the CEO's career. And she said after that, she started looking for the difficult people. But it's really painful to talk about. It's not fun to hear the ways that you suck. And, and, and on the data one, and this is one that um, we both do executive education. This was a brilliant one. So so this woman described to me, um, so she's in an executive team and there's the male CEO and there's there's three women and three men, okay? The, the male CEO constantly interrupts the women, but never the men. And this, you know, we know the data. Men interrupt more than, it's, 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 it's asymmetrical. And there's also evidence that when women get more power, uh, they don't talk anymore. But the more power a man gets, the more they talk. From the U.S. Senate, by the way, is, is data. It's an ASQ article. <laughs> anyway, so what, what these women did was they just counted. They just counted the number of interruptions that this guy did. And he's one of those guys who meant well. And they showed him the data. Mm-hmm. And, he, and, and it was something like 10x. And, and he actually changed his behavior. So to me... That's a that's a pretty good and, and that, that's not something I did, but um, but that's a case where the CEO was uh, kind of a clue. Oh, that's another distinction I make is between clueless assholes and strategic assholes. <laughs> oh, describe a strategic asshole. Uh, well, so uh, so where I learned this, and I don't even this is my book. So so I don't think this is an accident. When I wrote the no asshole rule, my wife was managing partner of a law firm that had about a thousand lawyers. So, so a lot of her job, I didn't see much trouble yet with her. A lot of her job was asshole management. And she would say that <laughs> my job, and, and she'd come home and she'd say stuff, you know, like the key to asshole management is turning your assholes on and off. Cause the litigation people, you, you actually want an asshole on your side for litigation sometimes. Anyway, so, so, but, but, a lot of her job was talking to these partners about their difficult behavior. Okay. And, and so, so if she, and, and her firm was good because what thing they would do is they would actually penalize uh, the ones who were nasty. So, so the way, the way law firms work for those, you know, the way, the way, the way a law firm works a partnership and what they do is they divide up all the money at the end of the year and give it to all the partners. They don't save any, they just divide it up. And so the so the bonus is really important. And and her and the woman, uh, I better not use that name, I'll get in even more trouble, who she ran the firm with. It was the first AMLA 100 firm ran by women. And um, and they would sit down, these guys, and they'd say, well, you are getting $150,000 less year because uh, you have been abusive to people and you need to change your behavior. Sometimes they leave. Um, so th- there's kind of three responses. Once they leave, the, the other response was, oh, they, you know, Jeff Faffer's thing, what's the game? Oh, the game is I've got to be nice. And they change. <laughs> and those were the strategic assholes. Those I, were the ones who it were sort of had some awareness. But I, I remember, you know, Marine would say some of the worst ones were the ones who just have no idea how badly they're coming across. And we do know this. And I, you know, one of, one of my um, children is autistic. So I'm very much aware of this. 
that 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 and I'm not saying that all people are assholes are autistic, although some although Elon Musk apparently I think has even said he's on the spectrum. Um, but 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 when you don't have awareness of how you come across to others, if you have a blindness, we all do to some degree. But but there's sort of like a spectrum of the degree to which humans are socially sensitive. And that's another area, and you probably know this research by Anita Woolley that uh, that guys are worse than um women at that. Like we're we're we have much less social sensitivity than women on average. So uh so I, that's sort of a sort of a long rant, but those those are sort of like the three responses to being told you're an asshole. Um, and it's gonna cost you money, you leave, you change. Or you have no idea how you're coming across and have no idea how to change. So, so do do you recommend coaching or what? Well, co- I think coaching helps. Mm-hmm. Coaching and 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 a little humility helps. And 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 the 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 other thing, and, and this is sort of to me the the problem with being individualistic. The way that um, for CEOs and other senior executives is their teams are so important be, because if they've got people around them who um listen to them who who, who tell them the who who tell them the, the the truth so it's funny that Diego's there when Diego had this boss um uh is it Brad Smith Brad Smith uh, is, there's a Brad Smith at uh, Microsoft this is a different Brad Smith who was CEO of Intuit Brad Smith that guy had such high social sensitivity and, and Diego will tell you cuz Diego was a senior executive at Intuit that guy was just amazing and um and so so that's what you do. And, and some of you may also have heard of uh, Bill Campbell, the famous Silicon Valley coach, the, the trillion dollar coach. That was one of the things that he. So for those who don't know, the most amazing human being you ever met, just astounding. He was well, you're at Columbia. He his he was the coach of the Columbia football team. Terrible coach. Uh, just in terms of win loss record, and they came to Silicon Valley, and eventually, uh, and he was out. He was on, on Intuit's board or, or CEO of Intuit at one point too. But but Bill would just coach people like Steve Jobs, like the like the Google folks, the Twitter folks, and mostly he wouldn't take money from them either. And sometimes he would coach. Um, he, he would coach folks, and and to go back to Steve Jobs, who um, is described as an asshole and probably was an asshole early in his life. The story, there's a second part of, of the Steve Jobs story that doesn't always come out. And our friend Ed Catmull always tells me this. I put this in the Asshole Survival Guide. Is that in the, yes, in the early days, Steve was a jerk and he still could be tough later on in his life. But the older he got, um, the better he got about being a civilized human being. And there are kind of three things. One, he got kicked out of Apple. Two, he failed at next. And then Bill Campbell who lived right near him would go for a walk with him every Sunday and help was among the people who helped him become a better human being. And, and, and I remember uh, talking, talking to Ed, maybe six or seven years ago, Ed Catmull, when he was still at, um, at Pixar and Ed said, you know, it's really interesting because in my life, I, there's, there's two people who are quite famous that, that I've seen. Uh, one got better and better over time. And he said, Steve Jobs, he said, by the end, he was just kind of like warm and fuzzy. And in another Steve Jobs story is my friend, David Kelly, the founder of IDEO and of the Stanford D School. When, when David had cancer, Steve Jobs, and this is when the iPhone, the first iPhone was coming out, um, Steve Jobs would go to the hospital two or three times a week and, and show, by the way, more, I think more than David his wife and 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 would show support and love with him and he'd yell at the nurses and doctors on his behalf because that's how Steve Jobs shows love and so 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 the story about Steve is from according to Ed is Steve got nicer and nicer and nicer over years and there's a guy named John Laster who got worse and worse and worse and ultimately got kicked out of Disney so so we can't change over time and uh, and and so to me, I guess the point that I'm making, if you for CEOs, if they have coaches, they have people in their life, and also people can change. And and it didn't hurt Steve the fact that uh, that you know, sort of when he was in his 30s, he thought he was the most hot shit in the world, but he got brought down a notch by being fired mm-hmm. and by having a failure at next. So mm-hmm. so and, and and Ed describes that as when Steve wandered into the wilderness is the way that Ed described that. He I, I remember hearing him say I spent seven years wandering in the wilderness. Yeah. Oh and, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, interesting. Very interesting. So people can change. So bring this to where we are, you know, now. I mean, we're sort of wandering our way back to whatever the next thing is after the pandemic. We're we're seeing oh. layoffs now. You know, I mean, all these companies are sort of waking up with hangovers. I, I that's kind of how I think about it. The easy money is not floating around. You know, the easy <laughs> money is not floating around. You know, and so and so people are having kind of a reckoning. Um what do you think is going on? You know, it 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 it, it oh. seems weird to me. I mean, I did I did, by the way, say once the easy money stops flowing, all these companies doing stuff that makes absolutely no sense are going to have to stop doing those things. So I did say that. <laughs> but, well, well it, it 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 is interesting, and in, and I think the point that part of the point that you're making, at least that that it's making me think, is is that and we and we've we've all been through different business cycles, and and we in, there's always the point in the business cycle where, well, employees are really important. We really love about them and we really care about them. And then they fire all of them. So, 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 so the point is that, that you know, it used to be when I was younger, it was the man, but now sometimes it's the woman too. When they tell you love you and how important you are, well, be careful that love is temporary. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and so, so, so the question is, in the, so I did my dissertation, by the way, and got tenure on organizational decline and death. So early in my career, I studied this a lot. And every day, How cheerful. You know, How cheerful. I, I, I have a paper on funerals for dying organizations, even. Anyway, well, it was in Michigan in the early 80s. There was a lot of organizational decline and death. But but there is still a difference. But And and, and uh uh, and, I, and I noticed Adam's been sending out the Adam Grant's been sending out some of the papers lately. There's there's two parts of if you're in a situation in organizational decline, um, and you have financial troubles. There's there's two things that I think that um, well, not all leaders are so good at, although some are better than others. One is well, there, even the, and, and our friend Jeff Pfeffer's complaining about this too. Layoffs are really contagious. And it's clear. So maybe they really all need to do almost exactly a 10 to 15% layoff. But if you look at at least the early ones, they're all 10 to 15%. Like, what is it about that number? So, so, the, so the evidence is, and meta analysis and large scale um, studies is that on average, although you could often can get a short term spike um, in the in, for your stock price for doing a layoff, on average, companies that do it last and do it least controlling for you can control for do better in the long term and and there's at least two reasons they do better in the long term one reason they do better in the long term is they have less of there's less fear in the organization because when you lay off people there's these survivor effects that, that people get in fear and they hunker down and they, and, and people are very bad at, at guessing whether or not they're valuable to the company or not so that's one problem and the other problem is well when things come back you've got more good people so you don't have to go out and hire all these people. They're already onboarded. You know? So, so that's one part. And, and, uh, and there's another part, and you see really a lot of variation in this is, is that there's also good evidence um, that, that the way that um, layoffs, some organizations are doing pay cuts, that the way you do it is as important as what you do. That's more my work. So, uh, so, I mean, there's very good evidence that if you do it in such a way, you give people predictability, you give people understanding, control, and compassion, that 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 though they won't take it so personally, and they'll love you more. And um, so back to Bill Campbell, he was famous when he was a CEO for and also coaching CEOs. When you do layoffs, uh, be visible, help them carry out their boxes to their car, give them a hug. And, and he would say, you know, first of all, it gets rid of fear in the in, in the world. And the other thing he used to always say is it's a long life. You may want to hire them in the future. And you may want to work for them in the future. Mm -hmm. So, so there's lots of reasons to do it in a sort of a sort of civilized way. And uh, and if if uh, people want to watching want, want a, a a great model of how to do this, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, Airbnb did a layoff. Brian Chesky mm -hmm. model layoff showed love, and did things like you have a few weeks to hang around and say goodbye, and turned uh, his recruiter folks into outplacement folks. And then the other thing is he told them, you can keep your company laptop because that'll help you get a job. And, and and in contrast, you can see Elon Musk is sort of hunting down the people he's fired to get their laptops back to give you sort of an interesting comparison. But so to me, that's that's the, the two things. 
it, and, and, and by the way, this is where I probably disagree with Jeff Pfeffer, is Jeff Pfeffer says you should never do layoffs. Sometimes you have the wrong people because you're a strategy professor. You got the wrong people. Uh, they're the wrong set of skills. And you don't have any of the right people in some, and, and, and you have to do a strategic shift to, to survive. And, uh, and, and sometimes it is necessary. Yep. So I, I don't, I don't think it's always, some people say it's always immoral. I'm not willing to go there yet. I think strategically, sometimes it has to happen. Well, if you make a shift in strategic direction, by definition, the people you had are not the people that are going to be part of what you need going forward. Yes. So I agree with you, but there's, there is a humane way to do it and a not humane way. So, oh, my favorite layoff story. So mm-hmm. and Patty McCord, who she's in like that group with us, pa- Patty McCord was head of HR um, or whatever they called it at Netflix for the first 14 years. The most entertaining CHRO I've ever met. She swears more than any executive I've ever met, too. <laughs> So one of the stories Patty told me, early days of Netflix, this is about 2001 or so, the, the meltdown hit Silicon Valley. And, and, and the way Patty described it is we had all we had the, the, the DVD part of the business in Netflix, and we're in a bunch of other ancillary businesses. It's about 400 people. And she said, so we pulled everybody out in the parking lot, 400 people. And she said, we said to them, we love you all. Um, but we have to fire half of you now. Otherwise, we're going to have to fire all of you in a few weeks. And it, it, and then she said, and we hugged the 200 people, and then we went back into, into the building. And, and I and to me, that's that's actually reasonably compassionate. It's, it's kind of mm-hmm. shocking. Mm-hmm. Um, but but it was either that or there would be no modern Netflix. And you know, the, other, the other thing about that story, which I, I think is fascinating, is that as um, Reed Hastings would later say, he said, you know, facing this, like half the people are gone, and you know, this is going to be terrible. And he said what he then found out was everybody was operating at a higher level. <laughs> right. you know, that, that the people that were left were, and he describes it as talent density, I think is the phrase. That right. Oh yeah. The tell Yeah. So, so, so that, but let's, that talent density thing is interesting because, because I, I, I won't use his name, but somebody may be able to figure it is. I have a friend um, who sold eight companies to Twitter, eight. Okay. Wow. <laughs> and, and. Um, he's their venturing arm, but. <laughs> but he's a, he's, he's, he's a pretty good savvy investor. Okay. But so that means he got a lot of Twitter stock, right? His argument, and this is the difference in what you do and how you do it, is that Twitter, and he know he would know what happened to those companies, and he didn't have the stock, of course. And he said Twitter was the most bloated, slow or a tech company I've ever dealt with. Mm-hmm. And it was driving him absolutely nuts. So this is where I'm not defending Elon for how he did it, but clearly. There are some internal issues at Twitter that needed to be taken care of, and and so I was really interesting because 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 when when Elon was asking weird acting weird, I started going backstage to ask people like, like what's going on, and 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 some of the people who knew him or knew about him said yes, he's got people, he's surrounding himself with with yes people who tell him what he wants to hear, and obviously just what happened yesterday, what he's not doing very good with bad news, but on a strategic question. Or, or a workforce composition question. Well, there was something wrong with that organization. And that, and that's, I mean, Huggy and I are very interested in, in administrative bloat and other kinds. Many mm-hmm. organizations are bloated, mm-hmm. but but there's a difference in what you do and how you do it. One one more time, my yeah, motto. So one of the things that, um, well, one question first, and then I want to ask you about how you grow without ossifying. Um, so Greg Galley wants to know, how, how do you keep <laughs> assholeness out of AI? <laughs> oh, I don't know. So, organization. How do you? Great question. So, so I'm not a. You know, I'm in the engineering school. I'm surrounded with people. And the main thing I've learned is that they know so much more about it than I do. But one thing they do teach me is that uh, is that AI. It's it's just the algorithm is just a function of the human being who writes it. Isn't that what it is? Yeah. So so maybe we just have to have fewer assholes writing algorithms. That's kind of the <laughs> that's kind of the best I can do. We need but, to we need to completely rethink who goes into computer science programs then. <laughs> and gaming. <laughs> well, well, you know, it's interesting. So I I I I right now engineering is mostly CS and even so I teach management science and engineering which is we're sort of like the businessy we're not supposed to say this was sort of the management part of it but all of our students get CS they all so almost 100% of Stanford undergraduates take introduction to computer science almost 100% and um 
So, and, and but but my perspective about CS professors is that uh, they can be kind of clueless, but they actually most of them tend to be pretty decent human beings. Mm -hmm. But the problem is the cluelessness is they're not there isn't much cruelty among them. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Interesting. So um, yeah, I know your book with Huggy on, on scaling up and the new book on friction. Um, you know, you talk about organizations that sort of as they mature, um, they sort of pick, it's almost like barnacles, right? You know, you pick oh, yes. up processes and procedures and, and stuff like that. And have you seen cases where companies have righted the ship and-, and Oh, well, well yeah. So, so that's, that's a great, so our, one of our mottos is that, is that um, as organizations grow, so you think of scaling is scaling is we say it like the problem of more that how you get sort of bigger, but the problem of more is also a problem of less. What good organizations do is they're extremely disciplined about not adding too much stuff and constantly subtracting. Mm -hmm. And and in in, in 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 the ones that do it well, um, don't have to do the sudden deep layoffs because they didn't go crazy. And and, and right now it's kind of interesting. Um I don't think Apple's done any large scale layoffs yet. And I think some of that is Tim Cook, that guy is so disciplined. He is so disciplined. And, I, I'll, I'll, and if you don't add it in the first place while you're scaling, you don't have the blow to get rid of. I, I, I'll tell you a great story. And this, this is a friend of ours. Well, I, I, I may get in trouble with this, but, but he was head of HR for five years. I won't use his name, but really he's the friend he is. Okay. So we're talking, this is just a few weeks ago. And this didn't make it in the book because I'm saying, can you give me an example about, about a situation where stuff isn't added so you don't have to subtract it? And so he tells me a Tim's Cook story. Okay, so he's CHR of Apple. 100,000 people work there. So what he wants to do is he wants to hire one more executive assistant for the London office, okay? And he goes to Tim. And Tim's, so Tim says, can I see the layout of the office? He wanted to see a blueprint because he wanted to figure out whether they could share one of the existing assistants before he would give our friend permission to hire one person. This is think about that. And and to me, that's a sign of somebody who understands how to scale. And there's lots of things about Apple I don't like. I'm not saying I'm I'm not like an Apple fan and worship everything they do, but but when you actually show some discipline, that helps. Um, and 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 so to me that that sort of subtractive mindset is always happening. And this is back to the organizational psychology part. Oh, here it is. This is one of my favorite books. I'm going to advertise this. It's my pal Lydie Klotz wrote Subtract. Ah, great book. Uh -huh. um, and, oh, I got to show you. This is really funny. All of us have written books. You know that uh, there's the inside jacket flap. Mm -hmm. So what they did was they wrote the jacket flap and they just un they and they crossed the whole thing out and the, and the stuff that's underlined is yellow is all that you need to read. So <laughs> they showed some tract in the jacket flap. Isn't that brilliant? So and this is a great book. So uh -huh. Lydie and a bunch of his colleagues at University of Virginia did all this research mm -hmm. on a, that essentially shows that uh, for we human beings, our default um, response to a problem is addition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whether it's uh, fixing a university, making a recipe better, planning a trip, um, building a Lego model, our default response is to add stuff. Huh. And, and so that's that's what that's one of those organizational psychology things. So, so the reason so much is added is as soon as we see a problem, we're going to create a new position. Mm -hmm. We're going to create a new department. We're going to create a new task force. And 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 so that sort of so what I and then what his and other people's research shows is is that um, is that when you get into into sort of like you trigger the subtractive mindset, then sometimes people will actually start subtracting. So and, and also being slow to add. So one one of the cases and Huggy took the lead on this a really interesting um, case um, was was that um, AstraZeneca. This was like four or five years ago, right before the pandemic. They had a task force where they actually got rid of 2 million hours by, by to me, having this subtractive mindset. They didn't lay people off. This was not, there was no layoffs that they, they would, they would do, they, they would do stuff like, well, uh, having uh, no meeting Wednesdays. That mm -hmm. would be an example of something they did. And, and it was both top down and bottom up. And one of the, one of the things that they figured out, for example, and this is really stupid, that it was possible to CC to as many people as you wanted. And you knew when you CC an email, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you're you're 
spend, you're wasting lots of time. So they made it harder to CC to then more than 20 people. You had to put in more friction mm -hmm. so that you didn't CC to like a hundred people or something like that. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and this, and to me, that's sort of like, like a social movement and AstraZeneca isn't perfect. And that has to become a way of life. But mm -hmm. to me, that's an example of subtraction. And then, and this is a piece that uh, Rebecca Hines, my wonderful former student, um, who, who is now head of the Work Innovation Lab at Asana. Um, so um, she did something, I'm co-author of it, but she did all the work that's in Harvard Business uh, Review online that we just published a, a few weeks ago. And, and what she did was she came up with a meeting reset thing where what people would do, and she had 60 people do it in marketing at Asana, is they would... Um, purge for 48 hours all meetings um, that um, with with five or fewer people, and then they'd slowly put them back in, mm -hmm. and 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 it saved about five hours a month uh, on average for people. And they they did three things: one, they got rid of meetings; two, they made meetings shorter and smaller; and three, they would replace meetings with asynchronous communication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But but to me, those are examples of that it actually is possible, but it, there needs to be, and we're just talking about subtraction. There's lots of other forms of friction, but but when it comes to subtract, you know, Lydie's basic finding is that it is that what uh what leaders do who are good at subtraction is is that they're constantly triggering that mindset and saying, what can we get rid of here? And so, and I'll give you a specific example. I, so I have chaired, I think 12, 13, 14, 15 um, tenure and promotional full professor committees over the year at Stanford, including our friend, Kathy Eisenhardt a couple of times. Um, and uh, most recently, Melissa Valentine, to, to, to get somebody to be a full professor or tenure at Stanford, uh, you need about 30 letters of recommendation. You need about 14 from faculty members, another 15 or so from students. So I keep saying to my dean, we need to cut the number in half. Lydie and I call this the rule of half. And I haven't made progress to half, but I think they're going to cut the numbers a little bit. And then I, the other thing I do is I have written my provost uh, multiple emails when she sends emails I think that are too long. Because I think if you send an email to I don't know ten thousand people at Stanford, you should you should calculate the amount of time that people waste. So uh, so I'm a bit of a pain in the ass about this, but uh, <laughs> I'm on a little of a mission. I like I like the idea of subtraction. Years ago, I was involved with um, the famous workout program at GE. Oh yeah yeah yeah. And uh, now did I, could I get? So what happened was um, at the time each of the different divisions there were thirteen at the time each got a different business school. Right. So could I get glamorous things like aircraft engines or uh, even the financial division? No, I got their distribution business. Um, <laughs> guys in trucks delivering no. light bulbs to small businesses. That was the piece I did. Um, but the guy that led that division was actually something of a visionary. And he took his people on retreat when the, the, the mandate came down. So the famous story is GE went from like 450,000 people to 279,000 or something like that. So it was a massive, massive shrinking. The, the neutron jack era, period. The neutron jack era. And, um, and people started to leave because the people had gone away, but the work hadn't. And so this workout program was one of the first of its kind, I believe, to try to tackle that problem on a massive scale, that problem of subtraction. Um, and uh, so I remember we went on a retreat. And uh, so this, this head of the division got all his top people. And day one was meetings. And it was like you had to show every meeting that was on your calendar. Oh, and oh. Day two was approvals. <laughs> oh, approvals are brutal. <laughs> because, you know, these very senior people, somebody would come to them at the end of the day with a stack of papers and the approval was like, shh, 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 shh. oh, yeah, you don't read them. You don't have time to read them. <laughs> so the, the thing was, why don't you just take the approval to the level of the person that's actually doing the work? <laughs> and it was just absolutely on day three and day three was information. Um, and at the time, wow. back in the day, and these guys had to bring in every report that they received on a routine basis and use a highlighter pen to highlight all the information they actually used from that report. So these guys would bring in computer paper, like a six inch stack with one like corner of it highlighted in the bottom. <laughs> so, but I mean, that was one of the first efforts I was aware of. And I think this, I think you're, that's really onto something, this notion of what can we, what can we stop doing? Well, it's certainly not original. I mean, I, I mean that, that that's another thing that I think is is worth sort of to, since, since you and I are in whatever is the 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 business of helping leaders and companies be better and so forth is is and and, I, and this is where I think my colleague Jeff Pfeffer is right is is there are very few things that are new, 
And um, I don't know, maybe some of the new algorithm stuff is new, but there's very few things that are actually new when it comes to human behavior. And, and to sort of quote uh, Jeff Pfeffer, that I, I'm more interested in what is uh, true than what is new. And and the story you just told about GE, uh, that is evergreen. And I think that's the kind of thing that that great companies have to do as a discipline and great nonprofits. And oh, just to, government, we should talk about government briefly. So we know how screwed up government is and stuff, but the, it is actually possible to fix it. There's this amazing nonprofit in Michigan, amazing. And I just had the, one of the founders as a guest in my class last week. And what they did, there's a form that is filled out by almost 3 million people a year in Michigan. Um, and um, 3 million people, and it's you know to, to get food stamps, uh, to get assistance if you have a disabled child, all sorts of, of, so these are like the, the people who need help from the government. It was the longest form in the United States. It, it, and my favorite question in it that everybody was asked uh, was, uh, when was your child conceived? Not when was your child born? When was your child conceived? And I can't, I don't, I can't answer that for any of my children, by the way. So, um, so anyways, and they did all this work. And now the form is 40% shorter. Um, people complete it much more quickly. The, the Actually, the number of people who go to the offices, the benefits offices, because they can't get through the form, is way down. So everybody won. So, so it is a situation where um, something was filled out by three. Think of all the time that was saved and all the annoyance that was saved by that. So, so, so I just want to tell that story that even in government, it is possible to make things more efficient and also in that case, more humane because those people, they needed those benefits. They needed to feed their children. They needed to pay their rent so and to get health care. So, uh, so, so I love that. I, so I, I want, want to be optimistic that it is possible. Oh, I think it's very possible. I mean, I started my professional career in government. I mean, I was my, my, I have a master's in public administration. Oh. I was going to be in government, you know, forever. And um, yeah, that's a whole other story. But um, it's totally possible if you get the right the right sort of mindset around it. There was a fascinating piece in I think it was in the Washington Post a day or two ago about this um, congressional committee on on the functioning of Congress. Mm. And they actually brought in a facilitator. And these were people who hated each other. I mean, Democrats and Republicans just <laughs> after January 6th. I mean, uh, one of the memorable quote, you know, I, I felt not only that my, had my husband cheated on me, speaking about her counter, counterparts, uh -huh. but that he'd also then come back and tried to kill me. Oh, oh. <laughs> I mean, very vivid imagery. But the intervention was really to, and the, the author of this piece was um, talking about um, you know, how these interventions, and, and they had people, they kind of got them in a little retreat and they, each person went around the room and talked about the events of that day and how they felt. And what was interesting to me was a lot of the attribution that was made of what the other side was thinking uh -huh. were actually false. So the Democrats were pissed off at the Republicans who voted not to certify the vote. And it turns out some of the Republicans were, had actually legitimate concerns about some of the last minute eligibility uh -huh. changes that had been made at the state level. And they said, well, let's just take a day and explore that. And it was interpreted as, you know, political theater. And I just thought it was such an interesting article. And her basic thesis was the woman that wrote this, um, and I'm blocking on her name, but brilliant book. Um, I'll send you the reference after. Oh, the basic thesis right. was everything we need to know about getting rid of partisanship and getting rid of some of these blockers to keep us from functioning effectively. We learned in kindergarten. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Well, I, I, I think that's probably true. So, so, so that's the stuff, you know, it already, and it's been around forever. <laughs> so, the, the, and, and, and I, and even though uh, that's an ancient book, so that's why Jeff and I got interested in the knowing doing gap. I mean, a lot of the problems in, in life and in business is not knowing what to do, it's doing it. Well, you know, lose weight, right? Eat less, move more. How complicated is that? <laughs> yeah, well, for me, it's complicated. <laughs> I mean, the doing part, not the knowing. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, anyway, Bob, we're coming up to the top of our hour together, and I don't want to impose more, but I, what a pleasure. What an absolute Oh, pleasure. it was really fun. More often. <laughs> I, I loved your, I love your GE story in particular. Now, that's that's the kind of discipline, and that, that's rare, too. And, oh, yeah. in Sil and in Silicon Valley, either we're going like this or we're going like this, and going like this, it's, it doesn't happen a lot. I, I think oh. Apple might be the exception, actually. 
So where do people go to learn more about your work? I know you have a great website. I have a, I don't know, Bob Sutton. Yeah, we have the same website. I'm, I'm builder Joelle. She's fabulous. Yep. Bob Sutton.net. And, uh, and I do stuff on LinkedIn. I used to blog, but I lost the discipline in my, in my old age. <laughs> um, so that Bob Sutton.net pretty much has, has, has everything and, or LinkedIn. And I tweet some, but I'm getting less enthusiastic about it to tell you the truth. Although I do it a little bit still. Okay. So thank well, you so much. A pleasure. Have a great weekend, everybody. And bye bye. Uh, Thanks everybody for hanging out bye. with us. Thank you Thanks. so much. Bye bye. bye.